Hey, welcome back to Business 150 Intro to Management. And we are continuing in our module on human resource management. Now, in this particular video, as you can see from the title slide, we're looking at perhaps the most important topic from an employee's point of view, compensation. None of us are doing this for free. We have our hobbies. Work is not a hobby. We work for compensation. Compensation, you know, initially we typically think of in terms of financial compensation, but compensation can come in many different forms. We'll talk a little bit about that in this lecture, but generally speaking, that's the very first thing that separates work and employment from a hobby or a pastime. You're expected to put in a full day's worth of work, so to speak. So how does compensation work? Well, after this video, we hope that you will be able to explain the purposes of compensation systems and the basic steps in setting up these compensation systems. That's really what we're going to be touching on, at least as an overview in this video. So when we're talking about compensating our employees, we're talking about creating a system. A compensation systems are the basis on which an organization gives money, goods or services to its employees in exchange for their work. These are intended, obviously, to attract, to motivate, to retain employees and keep them moving forward and engaged with the company. In order to set up a compensation system, a company has to determine, first of all, through all sorts of uh, ex existing information, uh, what are for instance, wage and salary surveys, what comparable firms are paying for specific jobs to get a sense for what is the market? What's the market rate for this type of labor? Job evaluation methods afterwards will determine the value of an organization's jobs and arrange these jobs in order of pay according to their value. And so let's just cut right to the chase. Yes, if you are being paid more if a particular role pays more than another role, it is, quite frankly, because there is more value seen in that particular role. Now, that may be a perception of management or an outdated um, evaluation that was made when the company first established those two roles. It may not be true in the practical or realistic sense, but there is a basis for why certain roles in an organization are compensated more than other roles in an organization. That is simply the basis. And then the question is, do we need to revisit that evaluation? But first of all, let's talk about establishing the, the range of compensation values for particular jobs. And so as you see there in the second bullet point, uh, the point being that for most firms, what that means is comparing the market, evaluating what options a willing candidate with the, no, the necessary KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities, what would that particular employee be looking at in terms of employee employment options? And so, you know, obviously, if you are looking for a three to five year skilled software programmer and you happen to be paying less than what comparable options are out there, you probably won't attract the type of talent that you're looking for. And yet at the same time, if you go the other direction and you end up paying two thirds more than any of the other comparable positions at competitive companies, yeah, you'll attract great talent, but quite frankly, you may be overpaying and wasting financial resources that you could otherwise dedicate somewhere else. And so it is trying to strike the balance of paying a fair and transparent and market rate wage for particular roles in the company, but then paying no more than what is reasonable, a reasonable expectation of compensation for that role. So uh, that's really the first step, the first couple steps, figuring out what is market rate and value for these types of roles. And as a managerial decision, are you gonna be paying at the upper range of that? Or are you gonna be paying, choosing to pay at the lower range of that? And of course, the answer to that will attract certain types of talent. So as you can see on this next slide, the pay range for a group of jobs defines the upper and lower limits of how much every employee in that role uh, can, can potentially earn. 
And typically there is a range that management has already established that this is average for someone who is perhaps just entering into this role. We, we may want to pay a little bit less, at least initially. However, someone who comes in and is very, very well qualified, perhaps has a wealth of experience, has more to offer than simply the uh, specific description of the role, we may be willing to pay that person more. So there's a range. Uh, and typically over time, you see the second bullet point, individuals are compensated according to uh, merit, how well or how long they have done that job. That's not always true, but that is a common way of looking at how do we approach uh, gradual increases, how do we reward those employees that we want, that we feel are deserving of uh, a merit reward, um, and then how do we send signals with compensation where perhaps individuals need to substantially improve, need to get better, maybe not by uh, punitive measures, but rather by simply withholding uh, um, increases in pay as a signal that while this is possible, we would like you to really up your game before we consider increasing your compensation. Now, you know that employees talk, despite the fact you may set down an edict and a rule and a policy that says we do not want employees discussing their compensation with one another. No matter what you do, people talk. People will find out what other people in their like similar roles are paid and that's where it pays, so to speak, to be fair and transparent. Know that people will figure out whether other people are getting paid more or less than them, and you want them to be able to perceive that whatever the differences that are gonna happen, because there undoubtedly there will be differences in what one person is paid versus another, over time differences will accrue, that they want to be able to believe there are fair and transparent reasons for differences in pay. So that will come up in the last video in the series regarding best practices, but that's certainly when we're talking about compensation, you want to be as much as possible transparent, balanced, and fair in establishing how your employees are compensated. Now, there is of course uh, the consideration in the third bullet point on this slide, one of the fastest rising costs in organizations are benefits. And you see some of them there. This is not a comprehensive list, of course. Pay for time not worked, or mandatory protection programs, or optional protection programs, or private retirement plans. And this has become more and more so part of the compensation package that employees and candidates expect that they will compare versus other options and offers they may be fielding and receiving from other competitors of yours. This becomes part of the package of how you reward employees for loyalty, tenure, performance, and the value that they're adding to an organization. So you may find that in juggling what you offer an employee, that not everything is all about the actual wage you're paying them, especially as employees get further along in their careers, other non-monetary comp compensatory factors become more and more important. Retirement plans, um, ancillary uh, ways to use and leverage uh, pre-tax income. Uh, I know famously of one particular company that offers uh, a 40%, an annual 40% reduction on any product purchased from Apple. They do it once a year, a group buy with Apple. And you get 40% off of the retail price. How do they manage that? Well, you really only get 10% off the retail price, quite frankly. That's what they're actually paying Apple. But the re because you're paying it uh, with your pre-tax bonus money, the net effect is you end up paying 40% less than you would because the other 30% is saved by using pre-tax rather than post-tax money. That's just one way that you can structure paying your employees exactly the same thing, but providing uh, desirable rewards and benefits uh, that are unique, that are novel, that many other employers possibly won't offer. And yet the employer will see great value in that, despite the fact 
at the end of the day, for you as a company, you're compensating your employees exactly the same dollar amount. So that's just one example of ways that you can creatively structure an entire compensation plan to provide more different types of rewards and bonuses to employees. It doesn't cost you anything more. Here are various elements of uh, compensation benefits. You can see them here. Uh, just so you realize, not only as an uh, a possible future employee of a company, but also as an employer, as you begin to work on how can you structure comp for candidates and employees, you can see here, there is what's known as the cafeteria plan. What does that mean? It gives employees a menu of different benefit options to choose from. Many, many employers are like this, where you have a choice of different health benefit plans. You have a choice of different retirement options. You have a choice of different annuity options, life insurance options, medical benefit options. There's a whole set of things that you, that you allow your employee to choose from. That's typically known as a cafeteria plan. A flexible benefit plan, you can see there, gives employees credits that they can spend on benefits that meet their needs. Again, it's another way to structure the same kind of flexibility and the ability of the employee to choose the benefits that make the most sense to them, right? Obviously, someone who has two toddlers, two children, are going to be looking for different benefits for an employer than a single person early in their career, has no children at all, and has a different set of long-term goals. There is also, of course, pay for time not worked. Uh, employees, are they paid days off? Are they paid vacations? Do they have paid holidays? It's, uh, a, a certain amount of sick leave or personal leave accrued? Um, as well as, you can see there, there are legally mandated mandatory protection programs, things like Social Security, uh, deductions for Social Security, deductions for workman's comp, etc., etc., uh, and optional protection pr programs. You can see there the brief description, benefits provided to protect employees. They're not required by the law, but provided to try to be competitive in the workplace, like ESOPs, uh, wellness programs, um, assistance with additional education. Um, there are, of course, uh, many, many different ways for college graduates to pursue a master's degree. Maybe the easiest and best way is when the employer offers to pay all the tuition. That's a wonderful way to get a master's degree, um, and that is one way that some employers stay competitive with ambitious and well-educated employees. And finally, there are private retirement plans that take all sorts of different forms, everything from 403Bs, 401Ks, employee matching, uh, all sorts of different ways that an employer can incent a, uh, an employee to contribute to retirement and pension plans uh, and therefore structure, uh, help to structure employees planning for the future. Well, those, again, these are popular programs. More on each of these in the textbook. You will want to read up on it, uh, but this is just an example list from the textbook. Now, that brings us to the last topic I believe that we're covering in this slide deck, the idea of promoting, transferring, and then sometimes needing to terminate employees or part ways with them. Um, you can see there the definition promotion, advancement of a current employer to uh, employee to a higher level job within the organization. And that's done for a number of different reasons, right? As a reward for past ex exemplary past performance. Uh, hopefully that's not the only reason you're promoting someone, right? Because as we've talked about earlier in this class, just because they've had a track record of success in one particular role, are you absolutely sure they're qualified to also have success in a different role with a different set of requirements? Um, not necessarily guaranteed, so be careful when you're promoting your employees, right? Now, for those employees who have demonstrated that they also have skill, acumen, knowledge, and abilities for another higher, more valuable role in the company, Yes, certainly promoting them to a higher level job within the organization is a wonderful encouragement, not only to that employee, but to everyone who sees that happen. Because everyone else sees, hey, that sort of provides an example that maybe there's a possible path for me in the future as well, right? It's an incentive, it's an encouragement, it's a reminder that you reward your valuable employees. And because that employee is already has experience in your organization, you don't have to train them. They're already 
steeped in that most important element of corporate culture. They already know how things work. They don't have to be introduced to the players and the stakeholders in the new role, so to speak. They're already familiar with them. It is a wonderful way to fill higher level roles. If you're doing it for the right reasons, for someone who's truly qualified to uh, to have, deliver exemplary performance in the new role after a little bit. Now, that's different. A promotion is different than a transfer. You see there are transfers defined as the reassignment of a current employer to another job at the same level. A promotion obviously goes upward. A transfer goes sort of horizontally. Now, that in and of itself may provide at least some sort of bump in compensation, um, maybe a small one. And even if it doesn't, it can still be framed as an encouragement, not only to the current employee, but to those observing this, because it will broaden the skill set and the experience of the employee. It shows that you are honoring their value to the organization. And again, you just have to be careful and deliberate how you frame these things so that uh, the first thing the employee asks is, wait a minute, you're asking me to learn something else, but you're not paying me anymore, right? You don't want that question coming up. You want to be able to address this and frame this as a positive move for both the employee and the organization, despite the fact it may not be a promotion to a higher level job. Now, there are always lots of different reasons why it's time to part company with some employees. You see their termination is the separation of employee from the organization. Uh, there's two major types you see there for, for cause termination. There's a reason why uh, it would be best for that particular person not to be working for the company anymore. Perhaps there is a performance issue. Perhaps there have been incidents or events which clearly demonstrate this person as a bad fit with the organization um, or, or those kinds of things, right? Uh, so there is the four cause termination, which of course needs to be handled in such a way that is completely legal above board and for uh, and is defensible legally, right? But that's different than the layoff, and the layoff typically is a reduction in workforce that has little to do with the actions of the particular employee and more to do with the overall economic state of the business. And of course, nowadays, we're hearing about in this pandemic time, not necessarily layoffs, but we first heard the term furlough. A furlough and a layoff are two slightly different things. A furlough is typically used as a temporary term. In other words, you're putting them on a forced unpaid, quote unquote, vacation or a furlough. Um, and the implication there is that when things get better, we'll probably bring you back. A layoff, however, is generally seen as permanent. It's not because of you, it's because of us, but nevertheless, it is a permanent separation. Now, again, the company, when things get better, may call you back and re-employ you. However, it's different in that the initial sentiment of a layoff is a permanent separation, and the initial sentiment of a furlough is a temporary separation. So just so you know the difference between those two terms. So you can see the last bullet point, uh, equal, uh, uh, equal employment laws provide protection for a whole number of de demographic groups against disproportionate termination, termination based on bias along a whole set of different lines. There are uh, some pretty strict uh, employment laws with some real teeth and that if an employer is found to be violating those um, and terminating based on bias towards a particular demographic group, yeah, there's some very large penalties that can be involved and have been involved in precedent court cases. So we hope that this provides a bit of a landscape for you to understand uh, what a, a compensation system that you set up and establish is trying to do and the basic steps and how you begin to get those things set up and at least some of the large considerations you need to take into account. Now, this is a big subject, obviously how you compensate your employees and how you set up a compensation system, plan and tiers of different levels of compensation within your organization. It's a huge deal. And this is, of course, just one introduction, a brief video lecture introduction to the topic. If you eventually, for instance, became a HR uh, major with a four-year degree, you would have an entire track of courses uh, that discuss nothing else but talking about how to build compensation systems and how to do that while uh, complying with uh, federal and state law in this matter. So again, pretty deep uh, uh, topic, 
Uh, and of course, one of the first topics that we really consider when we're job candidates asking about, well, is this a role I fit and what does it pay? So some things to take seriously. Uh, a lot more to read about this in the textbook, of course. Hope to see you in the next lecture.